Great. Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, as many of you know, BPC is a place where we prioritize the marriage of strong policy analysis with sharp political pragmatism, uh, all in the spirit of getting things done. And this is particularly true uh, for our energy program, which is our longest running project here at BPC, where we're actively working on uh, a federal policy agenda that can transition our economy to something close to net zero over the next three decades. And as I think we all appreciate, that is no small task. And this is why we're especially excited and uh, I'll even say privileged to be hosting this discussion today with our good friends at, the, uh, at, at EFI, the Energy Futures Initiative, some of the smartest people uh, in the policy business. And uh, I say business here very intentionally because the private sector really sits at the heart of the solutions to the clean energy challenge and our climate challenge. <clears throat> But policy is essential, of course, uh, because policy must drive commercial players to act. If it doesn't do that, that is if policies don't accelerate the deployment of ideas from the lab into the marketplace and commercialize them at scale, then the energy transition won't happen at all or won't happen fast enough. Uh, because ultimately, we're gonna need trillions of dollars of capital to flow into the private sector to encourage market deployment of all the energy technologies that are needed for the energy transition. And that's just too big a number for the public sector, for governments to do by themselves. So the investability of energy systems, of energy technologies, of projects is really central to the solution to the energy transition. And this, this, this idea of capital formation and bankability around advanced energy technologies uh, is really central to all of that. And it's not a topic that has been really part of DC policy conversations explicitly, as I think we all appreciate. And that's what makes this project from EFI so new and so important. Uh, and I'll let Secretary Moniz and his colleagues here describe that effort in more detail, uh, but I'm not gonna bury the lead. That's the focus of the Energy Finance Forum. Uh, and, and BPC and EFI are really aligned on, on, on these issues, as I think most of you who know our organizations uh, are aware of. And we're just thrilled to be here and to be facilitating this conversation with close friends in the audience and um, in, in, in the program, including uh, Chad Holliday, who's the long fr longtime friend of BPC, co-leads our American Energy Innovation Council. Jeff Brown, who I've worked with in, in a prior life uh, on project development, and we keep intersecting on these issues. It's really great to have Jeff in the mix. Uh, and Steve Camello, uh, who's become a close friend of, of the BPC in his short time with EFI. Uh, but really, when I mentioned earlier this marriage of smart policy and pragmatic politics, I couldn't think of two individuals who are more emblematic of this spirit than Secretary Moniz and Senator Chris Coons. Uh, we are really deep admirers of your work on these issues and just thrilled to have you with us here today to share your perspectives and your ideas. Uh, so thanks for that. And I'll now hand the podium over to the president of the uh, EFI Foundation and our former Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, who uh, I believe will, will have some of his remarks of his own to share, and then he'll move us into the program. Th thanks, everybody. Welcome. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Sasha and, and BPC for hosting us here. Um, I, I think uh, Sasha and the BPC have come to be identified as our serial collaborators. Uh, and uh, as he said, we are uh, so well aligned, uh, frankly, in, 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 our, in the spirit of what we do and also in the objectives of, uh, that, we, uh, that we seek. But I also, of course, thank uh, all of you here in person and all of those, uh, the many, many people apparently who are uh, st streaming in. Um, we're here to discuss, as, as Sasha said, the uh, Energy Futures Finance Forum, or EF Cubed, uh, which is a program we have started within the EFI uh, Energy Futures Initiative uh, Foundation. I should say that EFI uh, was established uh, by uh, Melanie Kenderdine, Joe Heizer, uh, and myself. Uh, Melanie and Joe presumably are 
the, for many of you at least familiar names from uh, uh, DOE folklore, uh, and uh, and we started uh, this in 2017 uh, after uh, the Obama administration uh, in order to bring uh, the kinds of uh, technically and data grounded analysis uh, to to critical issues in the uh, low low carbon transition. Uh, <clears throat> we th we've been doing that. Uh, we think with a strong again, technology policy inter in, uh, intersection. But as Tasha said, uh, we are now turned, um, uh, among other things, uh, turned to the uh, EF cubed uh, as a way of addressing this other challenge, uh, namely, while technology innovation, for example, uh, is uh, uh, always viewed correctly uh, as being at the heart of, of resolving the low carbon transition in multiple timescales. Uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient, uh, especially as we, uh, frankly, um, probably fall behind uh, more and more in terms of meeting the kinds of low carbon goals uh, that we need to meet uh, mid-century, but also on things like the decadal, uh, decadal time, uh, time frames. And we're not gonna have the deployment of large amounts of low carbon technology without unleashing private capital uh, at a very, very large scale. I think many of us think that today, if anything, there's probably more capital available uh, than there are bankable uh, uh, low, carbon, low carbon projects, where bankable uh, means that um, a risk uh, uh, committee uh, uh, an approval committee at a financial foundation says yes rather than no. Uh, and that means non-concessionary returns uh, can be viewed as a uh, reasonable outcome of, a, well, of what, are, what are often big time, big capital, long-term long -term investments. So that's what we're about. Uh, EF cubed, uh, uh, I mentioned Melanie and Joe uh, and myself as, as founding. Uh, but clearly, we needed to bring in very, very strongly the investor's perspective, uh, if you like. I mean, um, what is it that makes them say yes? Uh, and uh, you'll be meeting a, a couple of the people that Natasha referred to uh, that, uh, that have, are helping us with that uh, and actually leading the charge. So our goal is to address, to identify and address the policy and regulatory barriers to those large-scale uh, private capital flows uh, through a series of studies uh, which are that are technology-focused in some cases, and in some cases, cross-cutting policy-focused. That'll be described in more detail. But we're here today to uh, kind of kick things off in Washington because, again, the objective in the end is the policy community to whom we will deliver recommendations based upon the investor perspectives. But we're gonna to start today, uh, uh, very fortunate to have Senator Chris Coons here, uh, providing uh, uh, one, uh, one aspect for sure of that uh, 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 policy perspective on these investment questions. Uh, I might say that, well, Chris, of course, is the Senator from Delaware, uh, elected in 2010. Uh, he sits on uh, foreign affairs, foreign relations, appropriations, judiciary, small business and entrepreneurship, uh, and, and the ethics committees. Uh, Chris has championed bipartisanship and energy innovation very strongly in his time uh, in the Senate. And I can say uh, in my own case that I've had the benefit of many, many discussions uh, with Chris Coons uh, in which he brings forward, I think, his thoughtfulness and his creativity uh, on these uh, on these subjects of moving forward clean energy innovation and entrepreneurship. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, our distinguished Senator Coons to step forward, and we're going to have a little bit of a of a chat. I should add that uh, uh, Chris may or may not do it, but I'll make sure I'll do it for him. That he is squeezing this in between. A brutal, <laughs> brutal trip <laughs> that uh, uh, I saw him at one one part of that trip in uh, in Munich, 
at the Munich Security Conference just over a week ago. Uh, and then uh, I think, as he said, his laundry is refreshed and he's off uh, for another. another I, I may be fresher than my laundry. Um, <laughs> I see. I was in um, seven countries in Africa in the last week uh, and just arrived late last night. So um, great to be with you, Ernie. Um, thanks to BPC, to Sasha, and to everybody who's here. Um, one of the real joys of coming to BPC is to get to see some of my former um, staff uh, and AAAS fellows. So I know Franz Werfmann Stobler is here. Uh, I think Tom, <coughs> Denny Roberg. Um, so if you want to become a BPC staffer, please come work for me for a year or two first. And you can come here. This is where good policy comes to live and breathe. Um, so Ani Elverton and Lizzie Hunsaker are here from my current office. Um, great folks who are leading my energy and environment team. And Mr. Secretary, it is great to see you. As a trained scientist, you understand, which is sadly rare amongst many of my colleagues, scale, causation, consequence, timing. And I could not agree with you more that in a moment of multiple global crises, which occupied much of the debate and discussion at the Munich Security Conference, not least of which largest land war in Europe since the Second World War, global problems with hunger, uh, with refugees, with a once in a century, hopefully pandemic, nothing matters more than getting private capital deployed at scale rapidly to address a clean energy transition. Without that, everything else gets wiped away by transitions um, that we saw on the ground in several countries in Africa are leading to very wide-scale negative consequences. So look forward to this discussion. Thank you for the invitation, Great. Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Um, Senator Coons, uh, over the years, we've had many discussions uh, on public-private partnerships, an area that you've thought a lot about. Uh, including um, some novel ways of supporting DOE. Maybe you could uh, elaborate on those. Sure. Uh, at the end of the year last year, um, our president signed into law a bill that Senator Graham and I led in the Senate. We had great partners in that <coughs> to create a DOE foundation. Um, this follows on successful models at several other federal agencies. It allows the foundation to uh, put up a board of directors, uh, advisors from the outside, folks who understand the dynamics between our national labs transition to the marketplace, scaling, and then can attract investment and partnership, um, both from foundations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation just leaps to mind, I don't know why, um, or uh, major financial partners. Um, this is a way to um, strengthen the <coughs> correlation and the connection between our remarkable national labs and their cutting edge work, some of the promising, um, rapidly uh, deployable um, applications that RPE, for example, identifies, and then you know, connect it to the world of private capital so we don't have great innovations sitting on a lab bench, sitting in a lab, um, talked about in a paper, but not scaled. Um, it's now law. They're putting together a board later this year. I'd invite anyone who's here or who's watching uh, to <coughs> give input to the DOE, and Secretary Granholm's been a wonderful partner in that. Terrific. How do you, how do you see investors intersecting with that foundation? Well, I do think I need to let the DOE um, set the, the guidelines and rules, but in my view, um, investors should be driving the prioritization of how the foundation um, looks at and engages uh, with capital uh, financial flows um, and, and make sure that the work of the foundation helps facilitate critical research that for whatever reasons may be underfunded, helps facilitate um, IP transfer and technology transfer out of the labs and helps fund scale. The labs in particular have, um, I think, by general acknowledgement, um, not had the opportunity, frankly, I think, to engage as much in, um, in clean energy deployment and, and regional development. Uh, you, you, so you see that as a major, major focus here. Uh, I do. Um, Senator Heinrich uh, of New Mexico was on the trip, the bipartisan trip I just con con concluded to several African countries, and one of the things we talked about, very strong lab community in New Mexico, going back to the Manhattan Project. Um, he's very interested in conservation and economic development, and how do you get the remarkable work of our national labs translated um, into the parts of our country that need and deserve more investment. Um, there were some key pieces of um, legislation passed last year, one that will create uh, tech hubs in places around our country outside the sort of obvious top five concentrations. Um, of activity, uh, and another that's designed to look at communities that have been left behind by globalization and economic trends, um, to look at more rural and underdeveloped communities um, that could use the opportunity to transition to um, new opportunities for both job creation 
um, and cleaner energy generation. As I, as I noted earlier, um, I mean, EF cubed looks to come forward with uh, policy recommendations uh, that can help stimulate private capital. Um, clearly, as you just alluded to, we've had a year of remarkable plate of uh, yes. achievement um, in this context with the um, infrastructure law, yep. chips and science, yep. IRA, and uh, I think expectations of um, real traction coming up as, as the IRS completes rulemaking and the like. Um, what advice would you have for the areas that we should focus on for delivering policy recommendations to the policy world in this context? Um, so I'm going to talk for a few minutes, then feel free to interrupt and mm -hmm. correct. Um, as someone who was in the private sector in a global manufacturing company for eight years, and it's great to see my dear friend Chad, Hall Chad Holliday here, um, what will make a critical difference? This, this, is, this is a Delaware hookup. This is a Delaware thing. Right. Um, but we have to look at the constraints on our competitiveness. Uh, in my view, a workforce that is skilled and ready to actually do the manufacturing at scale, as we see announcement after announcement uh, of new battery plants, of new um, energy generation facilities, we need the folks who actually can do the work. In my view, that also points towards immigration reform um, that allows us to attract and retain the best and brightest in the workforce that we need for this century, an area that I'm uh, actively engaging on a bipartisan basis. Second is permitting reform. Um, Senator Manchin um, intended that broad-scale permitting reform would be a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. We took a vote on it. At the end of the last Congress, it did not pass. Um, there are folks in both um, traditional and uh, clean energy communities who recognize that the timeline for siting almost any major energy project of any kind is too long. Um, navigating that in this now divided Congress is going to be a challenge, um, but it is one of the things uh, Chancellor Schultz is most proud of about uh, the last uh, year in German energy policies, the speed with which they sited and brought online an, an LNG terminal in his, uh, the city where he was mayor in Hamburg. Um, and if the Germans are looking uh, at permitting reform, we also need to be in the game on that. $369 billion in clean energy incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so significant that our European friends and partners um, who a year ago were criticizing us for lacking climate ambition are now saying, whoa, 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 not too much. Um, I think we have a critical moment here to harmonize US, EU, UK, Canadian policy around um, what Chancellor Schultz suggested could be a climate club, what could be a critical minerals partnership. Critical minerals is an underappreciated but an essential part, as you well know, of making the transition towards electrification, not just of vehicles, but of a broad uh, range uh, of our economy. And the CBAM, the, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism by the European Union, is on track. It would be a tragic mistake if the United States and its close partners in the EU, in the middle of our joint efforts to try and defeat Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, went on a tariff war with each other, um, where they impose increasingly harsh tariffs on American exports into Europe, um, and we compete with a race to the bottom of incentives. So figuring out a way to harmonize that and to bring into one common um, community the price on carbon that Canada has, the ambition to price carbon that the UK has, the CBAM that the EU is moving forward, and an imputed price on carbon based on our regulatory burden, which has some real bipartisan interest in the Senate. Um, I've worked with Senators Cassidy and Kramer and Graham on this. I had a good conversation literally last night with Senator Murkowski about it. I don't think it's impossible, but it's going to take some reach and some creativity. Um, last, uh, I, I think we need to make sure that we're looking broadly, that we're also creating the regulatory space and the investment and the initiative uh, for next generation uh, nuclear, for SMRs and other nuclear technology, uh, for carbon capture and sequestration to actually work at scale, um, and for direct removal of carbon from the atmosphere. I think there's some promising proposals where DOE is looking at how to begin to create uh, markets uh, for uh, carbon capture, uh, direct carbon capture. Mm -hmm. you, you, just to go back a step, uh, you were just at Munich Security Conference. You mentioned the tensions uh, between Europe and the United States over the IRA, yet my sense is that that discussion is improving 
and I think you hinted at that, perhaps you could reflect It's improving that. in no small part because um, the Department of the Treasury, in its initial rulemaking, uh, allowed for a vehicle fleet leasing um, to account for some of the access to these incentives, and the leasing mechanism allows, to some extent, a workaround of the, the fairly restrictive um, provisions around requiring an FTA for a company of origin to have its electric vehicles considered. Look, the, the EV and battery provisions within the IRA are just the beginning of a broader challenge, um, and we need to figure out how to reconcile Senator Manchin's ambitions. He was the principal author of some of these key provisions um, to incentivize um, the rapid reindustrialization in a clean energy economy of a number of places in our country. One might imagine West Virginia is top of his list. Um, with our, our challenges and the potential for a real break with some of our most valuable partners. They're hearing from the administration a willingness to listen and to work together. Um, I think this trajectory I just identified with the CBAM and an American imputed price of carbon is going to be the vehicle through which this happens or doesn't. But that's very difficult to accomplish in a short period of time and to identify something that can qualify as an FTA uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. It's a, it's a difficult piece of regulatory work, and better than anyone, I think you would understand mm -hmm. how um, slow-moving the federal regulatory apparatus and statutory uh, interpretation and implementation can be. And one of our problems, of course, is the mismatch of time scales <laughs> yes. in terms of uh, time available. Um, uh, that's actually quite, I think, quite, quite, quite important. Do, do you see a U.S. CBAM as credible in the absence of a carbon pricing? Um, I think the technical work is difficult, but I do think um, that if we get busy working on it, and a bipartisan group of us have been meeting with outside analysts that you know sort of lean center right, center left, center, um, to begin the discussion of what the scoring could look like without an additional imposed or determined price of carbon, but simply looking at um, what is the regulatory or imputed price. I don't think that that's, I think that is a plausible path. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there is a current politically plausible path to add a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. Having worked hard on that for a number of years. Right. Uh, the, um, you just mentioned um, nuclear, CCS, um, carbon dioxide removal, um, all areas, by the way, in which uh, I might say the Energy Futures Initiative has been very, very active, uh, uh, having viewed all of these as critical low-carbon directions. And yet, we all know it's probably, a, if not complete, a fairly close to complete list of the controversial areas uh, where Frankly, in our, in our view, the focus isn't always on the prize of low emissions as opposed to uh, favored technologies. How do you see those conversations going? Uh, I think there are always signs that uh, uh, greater numbers in the, um, in the, in the climate community are, are uh, understanding that the focus should be on emissions, and yet there often seems to be retrograde actions how do you see this happening? Again, especially in this issue of time scale, where we don't have a lot of time to uh, debate uh, secondary issues. No. I'll try and answer. I'm not sure I precisely grasped your question. Um, one thing I haven't talked about, we haven't mentioned, is hydrogen. Um, there is a rapidly growing interest in hydrogen as a transition fuel that allows, whether from, you know, whether it's blue, pink, green, or otherwise, um, I am introducing this week again a bipartisan package of four bills relating to the use of hydrogen in heavy industry and in transportation and ports um, and in infrastructure. And um, if you are willing to be agnostic at the outset, whether the sole source is pink, blue, or green, um, you can get robust uh, Republican partnership in moving forward things that will begin to move hydrogen as a power as an energy source. Um, and as a critical component at scale. I think we could spend years debating purity and saying we're only moving in this direction, we're only moving in that direction, and waiting for the political cycles of the American electorate to deliver once again a government uh, and a Congress wholly committed to a rapid transition. 
I don't expect that to happen in the short term. I think we need to move forward and to move out briskly on every front as quickly as we can. We have a number of really promising new technologies that simply need the investment to bring them to scale. And if I could, Ernie, let me also bring in briefly some insights from the trip I was just on. Mm -hmm. Zambia, massive country, really very large country where 60% um, of the land is arable and currently untilled. You have a lot of hungry people. You have a lot of land that would benefit from conservation or reforestation, a government that is trying to deliver jobs um, and to embrace a private sector um, solution set and that needs a carbon market that is credible to incentivize conservation of vast landscapes and their reforestation or responsible management. South Africa, abundant surface coal, virtually no other energy sources. I mean, some wind and solar, but there it is the most advanced <coughs> on the continent and its grid is collapsing. Um, ESCOM, the state uh, power uh, generator, um, is corrupt, inefficient, and there were brownouts or blackouts throughout our two days there. Um, they are at genuine risk of having a nationwide economic crisis generated by the inability to transition. And as you know, at Glasgow, robust promises were made of helping their clean energy transition, something that is underway in Indonesia. There are incomparable investments. We have to pay attention to the global south and how it is going to build out. Everything the United States and the EU does in climate and in a clean energy transition ambition will be irrelevant if we cannot impact the trajectory on which India, China, South Africa, Indonesia, Brazil builds out over the coming decades. And so we have to be making sure that the technologies we're investing in, <coughs> that the new markets we're helping create, that the things we're bringing to scale will work in economies where, frankly, folks are trying to develop rapidly to meet the demands of their growing and young populations. If we don't pay attention to that in everything we do, uh, our efforts will end up having been wasted and will not transform the world into a cleaner and more sustainable economy. I, I would just note, uh, you mentioned Glasgow, uh, and I think when the Glasgow announcement was made, uh, restricting uh, multilateral bank investments in any fossil projects, including natural gas, the first to uh, raise their voices loudly were African heads of state yes. uh, because of the clear focus on, on, on development along with uh, environmental responsibility. I mean, uh, most of the reductions in emissions in the United States in the last decade came from switching from coal to natural gas. If American natural gas um, can supplant Russian natural gas, which it has in the last year in Western Europe, we produce natural gas with a dramatically low, or methane, we should just call it what it is, with a dramatically lower uh, climate footprint and emissions than Russian. We have to be mindful that there are places in the world where we can achieve significant <coughs> emissions reductions by permanently fuel switching away from coal and towards gas. The, the issue has to be there, there must be a further transition trajectory that is credible and is locked in in that movement. Uh, also, you mentioned earlier Ukraine, uh, and uh, I would argue that Ukraine has, um, <laughs> there are very few silver linings here, but, uh, uh, but one may be um, a stronger emphasis on energy security as a parallel discussion uh, to, um, to climate. Uh, is that something that you sense as well is, is happening? And, so, and especially how does it play out in the natural gas sector? In November, uh, Republican Senator Rob Portman and I visited Kyiv. Uh, we helped present uh, the Liberty Medal from our National Constitution Center to President Zelensky. And we visited refugees and we visited uh, his senior national security advisors. But we also visited the head of the national grid um, who showed us the ways in which targeted Russian attacks on their energy infrastructure were designed uh, to reduce the population of Ukraine to being cold um, and uh, hungry during a brutal winter. Um, the work of um, NATO and the U.S. and our partners to rapidly replace and repair um, a nationwide grid that includes the largest nuclear power plant in Europe that was under regular and direct missile attack was, in, was a challenging environment, but an interesting learning opportunity. <coughs> the most inspiring conversation I was a part of in Davos this year was one hosted by 
uh, one of America's premier investment banks and had 50 other financial institutions around the table. President Zelensky spoke. I was asked to lead a response. I thought before the conversation, this was going to be as every other conversation has been about, how to win the war. What military, what economic, what humanitarian support? It wasn't. It was about rebuilding Ukraine as a greener, um, more sustainable country that would have a distributed um, grid that would take advantage of renewable, cleaner energy um, as it is rebuilt. And it's clear that the rebuilding will be overwhelmingly done by private capital. Um, the United States may <coughs> invest some tens of billions more, but I would be surprised. In fact, I'm confident we won't have a trillion dollars with which to rebuild a devastated country. Um, the Ukrainian people in their conduct in this war have shown their remarkable resilience and innovation, their innovative capabilities. The idea that Ukraine could end up being a sustainable democracy, with a sustainable economy, um, and serve as uh, sort of the innovation model for a new Europe, uh, I thought was genuinely inspiring. That it's good to have something to look forward to on the other side of this conflict, but there is a very hard war um, to be resolved first, to be won first. Senator Coons, I'm afraid that we've been uh, using up all the time here because it's so much fun. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to ask one last question. Maybe you can make an observation uh, uh, or just go on your next trip. <laughs> uh, 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 clearly, uh, a major part of what we have seen in terms of clean energy deployment has revolved around, for example, the historically low interest rates that we've had for the last years. Obviously, ma major change there, uh, inflation, et cetera. What's your, what are your observations in terms of, uh, uh, first of all, since you obviously know how to see around corners, uh, where we are going uh, economically, and secondly, implications for the uh, energy transition? Um, a great question to which I doubt I have a great answer, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I do think that um, of the developed economies, the United States is the best positioned um, to be competitive coming out of um, what has been the <coughs> remarkable uh, economic slowdown um, that was a result of the global pandemic. Um, inflation is coming down. Um, I don't know about where you woke up this morning, but in Delaware, gas is three, $3.09 a gallon. Um, it has steadily come down uh, over the last year and a half. As an elected politician, I pay attention to how much gas costs because that, more than anything else, gas prices and grocery prices are what upset people and make them buttonhole me at the train station or you know grocery store after church. Um, I do think the fact that we have survived um, what should have been a huge disruption in Europe as a result of the war and the Russians cutting off uh, gas and oil and the Europeans cutting off uh, gas and oil from Russia. Um, we've survived it uh, relatively well. I'm amazed at how robust our labor markets are uh, and how much uh, drive and demand there is. And I do think there's a mismatch there that may well lead uh, to a recession that could be short. Um, the idea that it's even possible that there could actually be a soft landing in the United States um, amazes me. Mm -hmm. I do think that the actions we took in Congress last year to invest in infrastructure, to invest in our own advanced manufacturing and the chips and stuff, <laughs> um, to invest uh, in a clean energy transition, um, but to also address some long-standing challenges that impact the costs American families face from prescription drug prices to energy efficiency will in combination move us um, in a very positive and sustainable direction. Our critical issue I'll end where we began, is to align um, the ambitions of private capital and their scale and availability and timeline with our ambitions, policy ambitions in the United States um, for innovation, for advanced manufacturing, um, to be the country that is helping lead a global transition to a cleaner energy economy. You've assembled some of the folks who really are going to be a part of that, and I'm grateful for the invitation to join you at the opening of today's conversations. Great. Well, thank you. You've uh, kicked this off in a marvelous fashion, and... Uh as always, with the very, very interesting insights, and uh, we'll, we'll keep coming back. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Chris. Great being with you. Well, uh, I don't want to give you a cold. Um, I am going to just sit here and introduce uh, Jeff Brown. Uh, Jeff is the managing director of the uh, EF Cubed uh, project, um, came to us with decades of experience, uh, Wall Street and project development, and Jeff, just going to kick it off to you. Okay, no, no, yeah. oh, no, 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 yeah. no cold. <laughs> yeah, we're, we all have to worry about uh, the old viruses these days. Well, uh, so many friends here, and thanks, Secretary Moniz, and also thanks to Senator Coons for your leadership 
on many important fronts in climate policy and legislation. Um, in this short part of the program, I'm going to try to talk about the issues EF Cubed was formed to address, how we will address them, and the role you all can play. So, um, if you look here, it's you know EF Cubed will use an investor perspective to develop policy recommendations that will improve the investment quality of decarbonization assets. Theme already touched upon. Why do we define our mission this way? Well, consider three to five trillion of decarbonization investment deals required annually to stave off climate disaster and the difficulty of finding lenders and investors to do these deals, given the generally inadequate suite of government climate policies here and abroad underpinning the deals. Um, you may find the discussion a bit sobering. You should. But we don't seek to demoralize you, but just to make clear that the daunting financing challenge of decarbonization may be more daunting than the technological challenge and demands concrete action. The U.S., with the infrastructure bill and the IRA, has made some wonderful progress in the last two years, but it's not disloyal or ungrateful to say more is yet to be done. Now, to the next slide. Um, here's the inconvenient truth about the inconvenient truth, which is the investability climate policy linkage. The old magic of the free market utterly fails when dealing with a massive pollution control externality such as GHG emissions. It's the old tragedy of the commons. Only strong government action can, su can successfully grapple with this issue. And, you know, sometimes the politicization of climate in the U.S. has blinded many of us to this fundamental reality. Uh, you know, the constant refrain asked developers of decarbonization assets, well, what is your business model? The honest answer is, I have no business rationale whatsoever independent of government climate policy. So these three boxes, without compliance limits or credible carbon pricing, GHGs are simply disregarded in long-term capital decisions. All right, fine. Investments, incentives, grants, demand-side mandates can substitute for a carbon tax. But if the substitutes are weak, short-term, complex, they won't pass muster with investors. Um, and there are also non-price, non-cost barriers also that, unless removed, will still neuter carbon pricing or substitutes. And moving on, um, I really did love this report. Uh, and, and Citibank did a good job here. Uh, you know, I did used to work for Goldman and Merrill, so you know, no shade being cast upon Citi. But some analysts use euphemisms like the financial system not being well aligned with climate goals to tiptoe around the issue. And so here, the poor guys, uh, you know, in a wistful prayer to the goddess of neoclassical economics. And I didn't know there was a picture of her, but I got it here to the right. Um, you know. They imagine a day when the financial system is perfectly aligned to meet climate goals, a day in which the GHG emissions are fully priced with businesses and financiers responding in an efficient market. And of course, being intellectually honest folks, they conclude kind of like the movie line, today is not that day. So by, by Citi's reckoning, the climate finance is 600 billion a year now, it needs to be three to five trillion. Okay, but what's the issue? Whence cometh the misalignment? And who must remedy their behavior? Sorry, spoiler alert, it's not the investors. Um, you know, moving on, the IMF, um, the world's Uber banker, did squarely face the issue this year. And they upped the ante. Yes, governments need to price the externality of GHG emissions. But further, the IMF bluntly states, governments can't vacillate. GHG taxes, regulations, subsidies must be perceived as credible and irreversible. Does that sound like any climate policies we know anywhere? No. And of course, the world's democratic governments prize the prerogative of new governments to reverse the policies of the last government. That's how constitutions work. Fine, but that prerogative comes at a steep, steep price. Um, the IMF estimated that if a carbon policy is only partially credible, 
as opposed to rock solid, to get a modest 25% reduction in GHGs, it takes a much bigger carbon price, one and a half times as high, with an attendant four tenths of a percent annual GDP loss. This, you know, the prerogatives are not free. Um, similarly, you know, quoting a lot of pretty interesting studies, the Global Financial Markets Association didn't mince words in their climate finance study 2021. They pointed an accusatory finger directly at the failure of world governments to put the necessary price on carbon. And then they further detailed, pictured here, the cascading consequences of that failure. So they said, without a carbon price, decarbonization projects face brutal competition from carbon intensive, cheaper competitors. Sasha and I learned this developing projects. And there's no link between decarbonization assets and financial value. So ultimately what happens? There's too many high risk, low return projects on offer. Yeah, there's a lot of money out there, but it's not seeking bad projects. So meanwhile, investors in red, they would readily put money into low risk, modest return decarbonization projects if they could find them. But the investors cannot and they will not sacrifice quality standards. So um, moving on, and this one I run into a lot, is um, you know, many non-financier civilians, including my students, are sorely perplexed by this concept of Wall Street, whatever Wall Street is, shying away from risk. And they say, like, we thought Wall Street was this gang of gamblers with trillions of dollars waiting in the wings for a better bet than 2% CDs. I tell them, like, sorry, friends, gamblers don't invest and the investors aren't gamblers. Wall Street, that is U.S. investment banks, broker dealers, commercial banks, they, they do little long-term lending or investing, right? Wall Street transacts as a trader, market maker, underwriter, short-term lender. Um, meanwhile, speculative lenders are kind of mythical <laughs> unicorns, right? And if they do exist, their money is way too expensive for a project in the competitive market to use, okay? So who are the real investors? Well, the investors we must woo for trillions of annual decarbonization dollars, they're pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, mutual funds, life insurance companies, charitable foundations. They're conservative, mostly tightly regulated professionals, and they're looking for stable, safe, long-term returns. Um, this is kind of another workaround. People say, okay, corporations, you know, on their own balance sheets, you don't have to go to the market. Corporations can do what they want. And, you know, Mr. Holiday, can corporations really do what they want? Nah. Um, you know, big investors typically dominate a corporation's shareholder base. They call the shots. Yes, corporations can take big risks for small returns for a while, but if they do so for long, their big investors sell, the stock price tanks, and guess what? There's a new CEO, chastened and less willing to do that. Um, and let's also talk, there's risks and there's risks. So to the extent that any of these investors is risk tolerant, the investors are tolerant of kind of well-bounded, understood, sometimes hedgeable risks. You know. Recessions, interest rates, commodities. No investor happily signs up for nasty binary risks like Spain abrogating feed-in tariffs, Supreme Court overturning the clean power plan, geothermal and biomass being orphaned in the US PTC renewal legislation. All right, so let's move on here. And this one's a bit tricky and some of you won't see the numbers, but it goes to the following point. There's a school of wishful thinking whose adherents hope that we can do an end run around the standards of the world's quality sensitive institutional investors, um, finding moral ethical pools of capital sufficient to fund our climate needs. But sorry, those you know, pure pools, they're too shallow to do the whole job. So the main public capital markets are the marginal funding source. And in the world of finance, the marginal supplier of money calls the shots. The last person into the deal determines the price and the terms. So why do we think that you can't do a workaround? Well, left side, 
taking the U.S., um, the demands of future climate capex are very large in a macroeconomic context. Inside that little blue circle, um, estimates of U.S. incremental grain capex needs required about $300 billion a year. In the middle circle, a little further out, roughly three to $400 billion is the entire annual growth in the fixed productive asset base of U.S. corporations. That's already being spent on other mostly non-decarbonization projects. Right? We're talking a lot of money here. In the outer circle, it is true. U.S. capital markets typically raise about $600 billion of new money in equity and corporate debt. So, but you know, 300 of decarbonization soaks up about half that on the global basis, right side here. Um, let's look at decarbonization capex dollars flowing into the coffers of the world's big institutional investors. Um, starting from the inside, in this little green circle, we have been spending on the order of 1.4 billion a year on decarbonization, right? That's fine. What's the source, one of the sources, the principal source for that kind of money? Well, go a little further out. New deposits inbound to all the big institutions in the world, assets under management, last five years have totaled about 2.6 trillion a year. Okay, that's bigger than you know, the 1.4. Well, great, but if you listen to the IEA, we now need 4.4 trillion a year, next 50 years. And those are today's dollars. That we can't escape by, oh, inflation. So it's an extra 3 trillion a year. Well, okay, now all of a sudden, the proposed annual spending use just for decarbonization is bigger than the entire institutional funding source. So the, the quantities are so large is the point here that it is impossible to elude the strictures of the world's principal capital markets. So, you know, summing up, government policies, or lack of supportive government policies, erodes investability of decarbonization assets, but we have to pry trillions of dollars out of the hands of sophisticated fiduciaries. They're not compelled to invest in decarbonization, and they're constantly seeing a huge array of profitable, liquid, low-risk, non-climate investments that easily soak up all the money they've got to spend. So something needs to change. What do we propose to do about it? So um, on the next slide, if we go one more, let's talk about how EF cubed is going to dig in to the issues uh, to uncover and fix through actionable policy recommendations, the investability failure points. Um, Let's start with the investor perspective we introduced earlier. And we don't mean in investor perspective like, gee, I'd like to invest in this, right? We are talking about the rigorous decision-making process at the highest levels of investment bank commitments committees. You know, I have my scars on my back from those. Uh, commercial bank loan committees, asset managers, investment committees. And the question is always asked at these meetings about decarbonization investments or anything else. You know, a mattress company, a car company, or a chemical company. They fall into technology risk, revenue risk, environmental and energy regulatory risk, infrastructure risk, financial regulatory risk, reputational risk. And let's be clear, when you go in front of one of those committees, it's not like you get a composite score, okay? Um, the process is to search for the weakest link in the chain, and you don't average out one flimsy link with five unbreakable links. Um, you know, it's kind of once and done. You get one strike. So if we want institutional investors to play ball en masse and at an affordable cost of money, policy really has to deal with every one of the single risks. Um, so moving on, slide 11. As uh, Secretary Moniz alluded to, our research on this kind of complicated side, but I'll, I'll simplify it for you, is both industry-based and barrier-based. So for each critical decarbonization industry, like CCS, nuclear storage, zero-carbon fuels, each year, industry A, B, in a horizontal row, we're going to systematically examine the investability of projects across these 
six dimensions of risk called barriers here. Technology, revenue, regulation, infrastructure, financial regulation, reputation. So it's running down a column. Um, in horizontal industry-based studies, like our current studies on CCS and nuclear, we look for the weak links and try to recommend solutions to remedy the defects. Sometimes we take the vertical, or we'll call it cross-cutting point of view, when there's some aspect of a particular barrier, an example, say transmission and pipeline siting in the infrastructure vertical. Um, when one of these barriers seems to keep rearing its ugly head in every single industry study we do, okay, fine, so that's a serial offender column. We need really to dig in deep to understand how a comprehensive set of reforms might relieve that barrier for a host of decarbonization industries. In other words, right now we have too much special pleading going on, right? Each industry group seeks to narrowly fix its own problem with its own rifle shot and the heck with everyone else. We need to think about these issues systematically. So for EF cubed, the research shown here kind of on the left side, the first two boxes, the data gathering and private workshops and the other work, it's just a down payment. The real work is the painstaking follow-up engagement shown to the right. And that work starts as it does today with public dissemination of findings. We get the, but we've got to get the word out to Hill, agencies, state governments, investors, international experts, environmental groups, labor. So we follow up with briefings and targeted, with targeted groups, and we execute follow-up work to explore particularly interesting and thorny issues. Um, just to put a little flesh on the bones here, our first major study, which was uh, sadly unromantic, we released it on Valentine's Day uh, when Sally Benson kicked us off. Thank you, Sally. Um, after field work, interviews, commission white papers, private industry convening, six months of research, we honed in on the six issues on the left. Time's too limited to re-go really over our policy recommendations. So I encourage you to read our report, if you would, and engage with us. You know, and speaking of engagement, the work was well received, um, including at pre-release events, New York Climate Week, the uh, Pittsburgh Clean Energy Ministerial DOE Mission Innovation, and follow-on meetings immediately developed with even more after our launch. So kind of concluding, where do we go from now? So here's two sets of studies we're starting. Um, we've outlined a pipeline of projects that focus on industry-specific and cross-cutting issues. Um, our next industry work is focused on small modular reactors with the key keen focus on understanding the conditions under which a big order book of many reactors can be created, driving sharply down the cost curve through repetition on the job site and in factories. Um, looking on a cross-cutting basis, as just discussed, permitting is a hot topic. Federal action is crucial, but from a regional perspective, state and local uh, governments can do very much to complement the federal efforts, and sometimes constitutionally they're in control. And aside from that, um, an interesting thing, besides just creating first-of-a-kind incentives to move move promising technologies to commercialization. Um, turbocharging how technical information is shared is a really important issue in driving down costs and also lowering the risks for projects. So these are just touching on a few of the things we're working on. Um, I'd just like to wrap up. And you know, I know so many of you in the room and so many old friends and colleagues or college classmates. Um, so thanks to all of you for support over the last year, financial, technical, and moral support, which we need. Um, we're engaged in a really daunting task, but we feel like we're on the right track. And so please you know, do read our framing report for a deep understanding of our work and where we're headed. And we really do look forward to hearing from each and every one of you and working with you. So I'm now gonna turn it over to uh, my friend, longtime colleague, Dr. Steve Camello, and he's the Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at EFI Foundation. 
He's going to moderate a distinguished panel to share some additional perspectives on the issues we've just reviewed. So thank all of you for being here. And Steve? I'm honored to have the chance to moderate this discussion and, and follow on what has been said over the past hour or so. So before we do, allow me to make a few introductions. Um, calling in from, I would take it, San Mateo, California, thank you for waking up early, is Ann Simpson. She's the global head of sustainability for Franklin Templeton, uh, the global investment firm which has $1.4 trillion assets under management. To my left is Chad Holliday, executive chairman of the Mission Possible Partnership, an alliance of climate leaders focused on efforts to decarbonize some of the world's highest emitting industries in the next 10 years. Former chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, former chairman Bank of America, and former CEO and board director at DuPont. And back to the stage, Secretary Muniz. Thank you all for joining us this morning. So the first question I have for you, and while you're answering, reflect on what you've heard uh, previous to this discussion, Sasha brought up the idea of pragmatism, right? That we really do need pragmatic policies to uh, essentially create an incentive mechanism for capital to deploy where we would like it to go. So thinking about that and not thinking about 2050, we hear a lot about 2050 and we're going to have achieved deep decarbonization by 2050. What about 2030, this interim goal? And thinking about 2030, and that is less than seven years from now, and thinking about pragmatism, what needs to happen between now and then that when 2030 rolls around, we look backwards and success has been achieved? And I'm going to throw that over to Anne to begin with. Well, good morning and uh, hello, Chad. Hello, Ernie. It's, it's lovely to see you from afar. Uh, I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person. That was my hope, but uh, things intervened. Markets need two things. One of them we've been talking about, which is incentives. But the other thing markets need is information. So on the policy agenda, we've actually got to be really summoning support to back the SEC on its mission to provide investors with the information they need to price risk. So likewise, the international efforts through the IFRS deserve similar support. Now, the good news, I think, in the capital markets is that investors are moving from the question of why to the question of how. And for sure, the policy framework, exactly as has been mapped out today, is going to be a game of 3D chess that we've got to be able to play between science and finance and policy. But the investor demand uh, for the opportunities to invest in is most clearly there. And I'll give you two examples. One is you look at the collection of investors that have supported the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative, which I you know, disclose, I sit on the steering committee, as you all, all know. Um, the importance of that is you've got 68 trillion of institutional investor money lined up behind the idea that net zero is a systemic risk that needs to be tackled. In other words, you're not just looking at, you know, at company level or project level risk. You have to understand the market uh, risk that comes from climate change. So, so I think without the information, the standards and timely, verifiable information which could be integrated into the financials. Um, investors are looking through the fog of voluntary reporting, and that makes it incredibly difficult for markets to do what they do best, which is price, uh, to price capital and opportunity. So when, you know, Jeff says we're in that competition on the investment management committee or the asset allocation discussion, or even just looking at particular opportunities coming through the door, it's a bit like, you know, buying a secondhand car. You're on the, in the car park having a chat and there's no information. So let's go back to old fashioned good work by people like the Nobel Prize winning George Akerlof. Uh, uh, we hear more from his spouse than we do from him, but he priced asymmetry of information. And we need to have that in mind just as we are able to price uh, the, the skew 
the distortion in markets because incentives aren't aligned. And I know carbon pricing is one area for us to look at. We've also been looking at tax credits, but I don't think yet we've talked about removing subsidies, which are skewing decisions. So putting those two things really onto the, the list of priorities for investors, where we've got these important initiatives to support and move forwards, that's essential. However, it's not going to do all the job that we need doing. Uh, private markets are going to be absolutely critical to the transition, not just because it's the place where some of the high emitting assets are getting dumped, but also because private markets can give us the governance control and the time horizon for the transition. So in this shift from, you know, in the investor conversation from why is climate change a financial issue, not just something for uh, ornithologists and people who, you know, worry about beachside property and so forth. Why is it a financial issue? As we're moving into the how, we need to be looking at the policy barriers, asset class by asset class, as well as geography by geography. So I, I think overall, there are reasons to be cheerful because investors are seeking the repeatable risk-adjusted returns that their clients demand, because as was rightly said, so much of the money in the system from savers is long-term and they need those repeatable risk-adjusted returns. And guess what? We have no choice in that matter because we have fiduciary duty to deploy. And Chad, I know when you and I were having these conversations when you were the chair, chairman of Shell, this conversation about being able to both deliver on the financial returns and meet the reduction in emissions is not for the faint hearted. This is fantastically difficult, but investors have got a real role to play uh, supporting companies as they make their plans, protecting them in the short term volatility and pressures, but also creating the demand for these projects. So, you know, all praise to E3 on the finance initiative. This is absolutely critical to us all making progress for the next stage. And being practical, I don't think there's any other way. Being impractical in a financial job, you would not last long. So, um, you know, well done for being practical. But I, I think the beauty of finance is, is people like data, they, they make logical decisions, and we can start to build out the models, but also the platforms to start bringing together supply and demand, because the money is sitting in the wings, the opportunities are not fully understood. And we've got to sort out not just the incentives getting aligned, but also the information beginning to flow. Thanks. Thank you. Chad, you're, you were name checked, so... The next response comes well, to you. Well, yes, we, we know each other well. We're old friends. <laughs> What's your perspective on this? Look, I, uh, I agree totally with what we just heard. But mm -hmm. let me just point out three things. Uh, when I was at Shell, we did something called an eco-marathon, where we had high school students build a, a car to be most uh, economic. Uh, and and we do it all around the world. Before the actual race, we had the students do a simulation program where they took different roles in a community. Some were the government, some were the utility supplier, uh, uh, some were the activist NGO, some were the investors, and they took the roles. And we fast forwarded to 2050, uh, the reduction of CO2. What's the world going to be like in 2050? What every student said after they got through playing the different roles in the simulation is the government's got the hardest job. Everybody else is singular focus, so it's good to do it. So cut the government a little bit of slack. It is a tough job, all right? So with that in mind. Uh, I heard, I think it was the 13th Secretary of Energy, if I've got that right, uh, uh, make a statement while he was still in office that what we need is a nudge on the policy platform. You, you remember that, Ernie? So, uh, I think if we can get a nudge on policy before 2030, that'll help a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have a carbon cost that's necessarily equal to exactly what you have to make the economics work. Because most businesses will say, if you got the tax in there or the cost in there, it'll only get bigger. Mm -hmm. And so they'll start moving a little bit faster. So I, I wouldn't hold out for the, you know, exactly what you absolutely need. I think the nudge will make a really big difference. And if I could just you know, give more, more of a narrow perspective for a minute, this Mission Possible Partnership Group. Uh, we focus on the seven hardest to abate sectors, most costly to abate, means they're the least economical today, which are 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. 
and, and our whole point is if we don't start on those now and figure out what the commercial projects look like, we won't be ready when that nudge becomes a real uh, bad, if you will, strong enough to get there. So we have to prove the commercialization now. So we're focused on finding leading edge companies that are willing to not have a great economic return, but they know building one commercial plant will, will be very critical. And if I could just close by my experience at DuPont, 70% of our revenue at DuPont came from plants that we built the first commercial plant. So we have a lot of experience to take a discovery in the first commercial plants. And what I can tell you from every case I saw, you had two choices. You can overbuild it at every stage to make sure it works, or you can build it exactly right at every stage and you know it won't work because you'll miss one of those. So the, the option is you overbuild it at every stage. So the first commercial plant costs too much, it's too expensive to run. It's the second commercial plant you start to see what you've got. So that's why we think it's important in, in all these critical sections that we start moving now. I, I just want to uh, ask a, a follow-up on, on this nudge and then what you also brought up with respect to DuPont. Um, how did you convince your board that the first of a kind was worth doing? What, what information did you use? Well, DuPont's not a good example because that's what we did, you know, mm -hmm. for a business. Mm -hmm. So it was less, uh, uh, it is really tough. I, I'm meeting now with the CEOs of, of you know, companies in our sectors, mm -hmm. steel, mm -hmm. aluminum, cement, chemicals, uh, uh, along with three transport sectors. And generally, they're scared to take this big risk because just think about, the, and we're talking billion dollar investments mm -hmm. here. This is not simple. And if they reach out with that billion dollar investment uh, and it turns out it, it won't run is a real problem. But, but if it turns out to be a very bad economic investment, and believe me, you know, the investors are looking at them. When, when you spend a billion dollars of my money, I, I care what you're doing. And so it's scary. And so we, somehow they need a little bit of help to get there. Uh, that's why this legislation that's passed in this country, IRA, et cetera, is so important because it's, it, it, it's becoming the nudge. It's not exactly what we need long term, but it is right now. So the work we're doing with uh, Mission Possible Partnership in Houston and L.A., where we're focusing on companies there, uh, this is enough of an act. People are going to move. We're going to build green hydrogen. There's no question about it. And the issue is, you know, how do we get the green cement and the green steel to follow on from it? Mr. Secretary, you were name checked, so I'm going to uh, ask you to, to chime in. Um, the notion of a, of, a, of a policy nudge, what did you have in, in mind and to what extent um, are we on that path with respect to what has been passed over the past couple of years, at least in the uh, U.S.? I, I think, um, uh, yeah, Chad uh, invoked the nudge. Uh, I think what I had in mind as the instrument was a two by four. <laughs> uh, the, um, and uh, the reality is the, as I mentioned in the chat with uh, Senator Coons, the, um, um, we should not lose sight of the fact that the, uh, the BIL, the, the infrastructure law, the chip science, and the IRA are a pretty big nudge, very, very big nudge. Uh, the, um, uh, nevertheless, um, in EF cubed, we think that there's more needed as one looks. And I think Anne was completely correct to emphasize uh, that this question of the, um, of the, the, the policy barriers, et cetera, uh, need to be looked at by different asset class, mm -hmm. by different uh, geography, I would add, by different domain. For example, Chad just mentioned quite correctly uh, the major first of a kind um, uh, barriers to be to be overcome, and uh, and in the energy sector, we don't have, or we, I mean the companies, do not have the uh, option really that let's say you know a major aircraft manufacturer has for looking right from the beginning of how to amortize first of a kind costs uh, on a very, very large order book. Uh, we have a chicken and egg here problem with uh, getting that big order book 
Uh, right now, for example, uh, Jeff alluded to the fact that we're doing nuclear. Good example, whereby manufacturability can be a distinguishing uh, financial uh, lever, but you don't get to the manufacturability without solving the order book problem. So th th that's the kind of, I think, work we need to do uh, on, uh, on still amplifying further the nudge in different ways, in different sectors, in different geographies, for different asset classes. Uh, I'll just mention as well, Ch um, uh, Chad mentioned uh, four particular industrial sectors. Let's go to the CCS pilot project that uh, uh, EF Cube has already, uh, that has already been done at EFI uh, as a prelude to EF Cubed. There again, we, we uh, you know, the policy world can talk broadly about, um, oh, well, we need to demonstrate industrial CCS. But we need, to we need to demonstrate industrial CCS for every different industry in a different way. And even within a, di a different industry, there can be such different process dynamics that you really have to have demonstrations of multiple approaches to overcome that. So I think this is the kind of structure we need to get together, get behind, get behind quickly, because again, there just isn't the time. Uh, CCS, for example, and nuclear, both of those. It's not as though we're going to have those deployed uh, at low carbon scale by 2030. But, geez, we've got to be ready by 2030 uh, to have demonstrable technologies that can be understood for the risk profile for major long-term long -term investments. So it's a, lo a long answer, but I think, uh, I think that's, that's all part of this. And I would just add, Wendy, one more thing. I certainly agree with um, Anne's focus that we need a lot more information uh, to the uh, investment community, to the project community, uh, to the policy community, all simultaneously so that everybody can do their part. But as a reminder, that's assuming the information is positive <laughs> in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the investments. And that's where, again, we don't know until we do it, frankly, uh, and, and provide the opportunity to work those costs down in ways that has been traditional, particularly in the manufacturing sectors. You know, thinking about the creation of information, you know, one kind of information that can be created through actually deploying, or at least demonstrating, is does it work or not? Is it at least technically feasible? Is there, can you build a business model around it? That is one kind of information. And we've seen the creation of a new office at DOE, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. How do we expand or, what, or to what extent is it required that we need to expand R&D R &D and D and D to have research, development, demonstration, and deployment essentially increase what, it's need, what the federal government or a government um, backs and supports to really take out some of these risks that are inherent in some of the technologies not just the technologies, but the business models around them. What do you think about expanding the umbrella on what kinds of support might be required from the public sector? I'm yeah, maybe I can yeah. add a, 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 a quick thought on that. Um, and it's really the need for us to back up this. Uh, you, you know, I, I think of this as your invisible hand of the market, uh, the visible hand, of public policy, you know, I mean, high five to get this all cracking. So, but there's also a, a really important role for blended finance, as it gets called. You think about that layer cake of capital, think about that fiduciary duty for risk adjusted returns. There's a really important role 
in the policy arena for the uh, multilateral and regional development banks, as well as other sources of potentially you know, concessionary finance for the, for the risk taking, the, the first off, first round risk taking. Because what you've got to understand is that private finance uh, can play the role uh, more effectively at the scaling up uh, level. And when I just want to clarify when we're talking about information, it's not just does this work? Can we get this cracking from a practical point of view? I'm talking about some of the basic definitions around uh, calculation of emissions reductions. And also I want to add on incentives. We've also got to think when you've got those really tough discussions in the boardroom, um, how is this going to affect people's bonuses and performance? How are we incentivizing investment managers? What's going on with fee structures there? I mean, one of the interesting conversations we're having at Franklin Templeton at the moment with um, several uh, with several uh, big asset owners is what about private equity and carry? How can we reflect the uh, impact thesis that we have along with the investment thesis, if we're making claims about supporting the sustainable development goals and energy action or decent work or gender equality, how does that show up in terms of the performance? So I, I do want us to take these ideas about information and incentives and say, run that through all the decision points and make sure that everyone's incentives are aligned. And I think, you know, certainly on our side, we've, we've kind of got an internal discussion paper that we're working on, on the blended finance agenda. But that really is a little treasure trove of possibility. And, you know, I used to work at the World Bank. I know how that side of the shop can work very effectively. But I, I don't think it's well understood throughout the mainstream investment community. And that can be, I think, another, another place where this uh, connectivity that, uh, you know, Eve, E3 can bring into this mix is going to be really important. So, sorry, Annie, I don't know if you were about to jump in, but blended finance is an essential part of this, the layer cake from the public to the private finance, uh, mediated by geography, asset and domain, uh, as, as Ernie was rightly saying. Thanks. Ernie, did you have, a, Secretary, did you have a, a thought on that? On uh, well, I would just add something. I, I certainly would agree with what uh, with Anne's points about the blended finance. Um, I would just add two things, and because the question, again, going back to the question about uh, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations and different aspects of public-private partnership, I, I would add maybe two points. One is to go back to the information issue. Uh, uh, clearly, when the government is partially financing let's say, large-scale demonstration project, um, uh, one understands that particularly depending upon the nature of the project, there's going to be some requirement for uh, proprietary information. But I would posit uh, that the balance has gone a little bit out of balance uh, and we need more information sharing. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the taxpayer is, is directly supporting uh, these projects and a huge benefit of that is the information generated for all communities not only subsequent project developers but the investment community the policy community i mean really all the communities uh, benefit so i think the uh, i think there needs to be a retuning of how information is shared uh, in these public private uh, partnerships um, the second point um, uh, uh, I would make is that I think the I think the government. Somebody said earlier the uh, the government has the hardest job. Um, um, I think the government needs to be given the government, whatever that is, uh, needs to be given greater flexibilities for creative approaches on risk sharing. So. Uh, we mentioned the first of kind again. Chad mentioned that, uh, for example, and that <coughs> you know Boeing's uh, solution is not not available uh, in this sector. Uh, but are there uh, risk sharing consortium models where the gov the government could play an active role in bringing together a number of private sector players uh, with the idea? that they enter into a risk-sharing agreement. 
Uh, and that can be for many, many different kinds of technologies. So I, I think there are more tools. Uh, we need to recognize the government has got a very important partnership role here. Everybody needs to row together, and the government needs to be given, in some cases, what are, what are non-traditional prerogatives uh, for, for getting solutions forward. You bring up an interesting point, and <coughs> Ed, again, going back to information generation and thinking about multiple companies within a domain or in an industry working together on the same issue, and sharing that information amongst themselves and more broadly because time is of the essence. How do you think about that? How do you balance between sharing amongst perhaps competitors, um, with the public at large, with potential new entrants <laughs> into your market? How do you think about um, sharing, generating that information to begin with and then sharing that more broadly where there may be uh, some risk to, to IP generation? So let, let me go back to one other point from the previous, and I'll answer your question, I promise. But uh, <laughs> and I really want to flag out the investor community has really been the organizations, uh, Climate 100, that have changed things in the last 10 years. Uh, and, and I think it's because, you know, from, from an industry, you know, taking my shell role, we, we felt pushed and we felt supported. Right, and so, so it's a little bit of both, which is great. That's uh, a good but, balance. <laughs> but we, we would not have done as much. Uh, uh, and I remember the conversation with you and others about, well, what yeah. are you actually going to do? Then we finally said, well, we'll put out a plan and let our shareholders vote on it. Do, do, do you support it or not? Advisory vote. Boy, you talk about a rough decision with the board. You're going to do what? <laughs> You're going to let their, what if they vote no? You know, it's all this. And then we'll put out a progress report every year on what we've done. And you can say, how are we doing on progress? If investors hadn't pressed, that never would have happened. Mm -hmm. And does, did that mean Shell's taking more investments? Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I, I think that's a, that's a very important nudge, uh, if you will, on, on what's going on. Now, now, back to your question on technology. I, I'd like to go back to... Like by four to me. Yeah, if, if it sure felt that way someday, then no offense. <laughs> so, but but the, uh, 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 I, I go back to DuPont, and DuPont, we, we, we made uh, CFCs. Uh, and when the National Academy of Science decided CFCs to create the whole ozone layer, uh, we decided we're going to get out. And we said, we're going to get out in five years. We're going to invent the replacement or the replacements. And we're going to have enough commercial, commercial capacity for all of our customers in five years. And boy, that sounded really good when you said it, but when, when I was one of the guys who had to make it happen, I said, how did we do that? You know, The way we did that is we had to convince the rest of the industry to go with us. We couldn't do it alone. It would be silly. You know, Nobody would adopt our stuff. The only way we got the industry is we agreed to license royalty-free all of our technology now and everything we came up with if they do the same back to us. And once we did that, the whole industry came around, and lo and behold, we did it. And then government had the confidence to go to Montreal and have a protocol, right? Because because industry did it first. So I, I I think we're going to have to have technology sharing, and we got to take the barriers down. And that's why if industries can work it out themselves, obviously with no antitrust issues, et cetera, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. How long, just as a quick aside, how long did it take to organize the industry along the, those dimensions to basically have the royalty-free licensing, the bilateral there? We came out with our announcement. The rest of the industry said, number one, the science was not complete yet. We were acting too soon. No, number two, uh, the, the new technology would never work. And this was the refrigeration supply to the world. This wasn't some trivial technology, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, healthcare, food, you know, not, let's speak of air conditioning. Uh, it took six months for them to be convinced we were going to do it and they were going to be pressured into it. But it, we didn't come out with the idea originally that we license the royalty free. That was the solution because they weren't following us. I mean, we thought they'd come around, they'd get pressure, but, but they didn't. So uh, I, it, it happened pretty fast, uh, uh, surprisingly fast. So pragmatic, fast, industry-led. <laughs> creating information to create essentially a policy tailwind for you. Yeah. What was critical was the five-year goal. 
that was non-movable. Uh, and, mm. and, and just from speaking from inside the company, I've never experienced something like that in my entire career there. When you had that public a goal that you were out there, you're, the, the way people pulled together and the way everybody wanted to work on that project, the way the very best people came to come, was really special. Uh, you can't do that all the time, but if each industry could have one project like that, it could be pretty special. So public decoration is the two by four nudge. Yeah. And now, with, and it's been enough time I can probably say this, because it was never discussed, or the biggest class action lawsuit of all times coming after you. So, so uh, and there was never a lawsuit about this, because we acted so fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be a model for how we uh, <laughs> achieve uh, at least a near-term uh, goals of, of 2030. We're one minute over. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists very much for the insights. Very much appreciated. And thank you so much for waking up so early. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience, the BPC as well, for all the hard work. Thank you very much for bringing this together. And um, I'd like to close out. Please engage with us and have a great day. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much.